All right, we are going to get started. Welcome, good morning, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and happy Universal Health Coverage Day. I'm Sarah Barnes, and I lead the Maternal Health Initiative along with my colleagues, Dikshita Ramanarayanan and Ria Karta, um, here at the Wilson Center. And for those of you who may be new to the center or not familiar, the Wilson Center is a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who remains the only US president to have received his PhD. Um, so we're congressly mandated, driven by scholarship, and fiercely nonpartisan. The Maternal Health Initiative is one of the thematic programs at the Wilson Center. So we work across all regions, and we really look to work at the intersections of global health, gender equity, safety and security, and their connections to US foreign policy. And we are thrilled to be here today partnering with USAID's Momentum Knowledge Accelerator and the Local Health System Sustainability Project on today's event, Achieving Health for All, Lessons from Strengthening Health Systems in the COVID-19 Response. It's a great topic for UHC Day. Um, today's discussion will include lessons learned from incorporating health system strengthening approaches into COVID-19 response efforts to sustainably strengthen resilient health systems and advance efforts to achieve universal health coverage for all. Speakers will share context specific examples of lessons learned and remaining challenges, as well as how the findings can support future pandemic preparedness and advance health system strengthening and resilience more broadly. Many thanks to our speakers who are here today, and a special thank you to Meg Ivankovich um, for bringing the discussion to the Wilson Center. So before we get started, just a few logistics. Complete bios are available on the QR code outside of the entrance to the auditorium. Today's discussion will include several points for audience engagement and Q&A. So for those of you who are in the room, we'll have a short Q&A session after each of the presentations, and then again at the end of our discussion. For those who are watching online, you can put questions or comments into the chat box just below the video screen on the web page. You can also follow the discussion on X um, with the hashtags MHDialogue, Health for All, and Health Systems. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce a pre-recorded welcome from USAID's Atul Gawande. Dr. Atul Gawande is the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID. Um, you can share the video now, please. Hi, it's Atul. I'm in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire today, visiting a primary health center and a birth center here. This is Universal Health Coverage Day, and I want to celebrate that we at USAID are supporting countries at every level to advance towards universal health coverage. That means getting the most important care that saves people's lives over the course of their life. It starts with a scaffolding of primary health care, and here in Cote d'Ivoire, we've made this one of seven countries where we've made a concerted effort to strengthening and getting the country to universal primary care on the way to universal total health care. I'm excited to be here. I've seen babies and mothers and men coming here for their most important services. This is our pathway forward. Thank you, Atul. And now I would like to invite another USAID colleague, Nidhi Bori, to the stage to give opening remarks. Nidhi is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID. Nidhi has 17 years of field-based experience in global health, humanitarian response, and national security positions, focused on building partnerships, driving strategy, and leading dynamic teams in complex environments. Nidhi, it's an honor to have you here at the Wilson Center. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to all of you uh, for having me today, and happy Universal Health Coverage Day. I also want to thank some of my team um, who's here from USAID who works very hard on our efforts at USAID to advance UHC. At USAID, as a tool noted, we believe that every person has the right to reliable, quality health care throughout their lifetime without financial hardship. We are committed to continuing to work with countries and partners around the world to achieve that vision and everything that universal health coverage means. 
I'm very appreciative for our partners who've collaborated in hosting this event today because having the space to reflect on lessons from our experiences during COVID-19, as well as how this work can positively impact future responses and the availability and ability of health systems to achieve universal health coverage is so critical as we work together to drive that mission. The COVID pandemic, as all of you know, severely disrupted essential health services in countries around the world, and it left many health systems reeling from the drain on resources. USAID responded to the pandemic with a a focus on immediate needs, but with a lens for the longer term rebuilding and structuring of health systems. This included immediate actions such as the provision of personal protective equipment and vaccinations, as well as other interventions that we knew were critical to save lives and decrease severe illness. But it also meant that throughout the duration of the response, our efforts began to incorporate a health systems lens to identify how through the response, we could also start to lay the foundation for that resilience and strengthening work. All of with the effort of mitigating the impacts of the pandemic on broader health outcomes, but also enabling and preparing health systems to better be better equipped for future health emergencies. We saw some of the real challenges that impacted health systems, some of which were outside the health sector. We saw how the impacts and stalling of global supply chain networks significantly impacted the ability to provide and equally distribute medical commodities around the globe. We saw how disruptions and hits to economies impacted the ability of countries to finance health services in the public sector and with a very significant impact on strains to the health workforce. And we saw so many examples that go beyond this. We also saw through all of these uh, components of the response and a reminder of how overarching health systems need to be agile, flexible, and able to scale to best address shocks to the systems. Part of ensuring health systems have these qualities comes from leveraging investments in USAID's core health programs. This process of leveraging our core investments sometimes can be less intuitive in the context of an emergency response. However, through the work that you'll hear about today, we have learned so much about where, when, and how it is possible to align our COVID-19 investments with longstanding investments in health system strengthening across our priority health areas. This approach has allowed us to save lives while also working to strengthen the foundational elements of health systems, improving long-term service delivery, and have a lasting benefit for the communities that we work in support of around the world. Most of all, this approach has enabled us to mitigate the indirect impacts of COVID on communities, notably the long backstanding backsliding of hard-won health gains. Examples range from including how we've engaged with local institutions in multiple sectors, including community leaders and public and private health facilities, to pairing COVID-19 investments with other health services, to analyzing how data and digital health investments contributed to advancing vaccine management and distribution. As we look around the globe in every region, it is clear that all health systems will continue to face shocks, whether as a result of disease outbreaks, protracted conflict, or climate shocks. The lessons from COVID-19 provide us with numerous examples of what to repeat and also what not to repeat during the next emergency, all in an effort to support the resilience of health systems to withstand all of these shocks as they hit them. As we work to restore essential health services to pre-pandemic levels by the end of 2025, strengthening health systems is not just an essential, but a necessary step, with primary health care as the foundation. This improves the chances that health systems around the world will be better prepared to respond to the next health emergency, ensuring we don't lose ground in advancing countries' universal health coverage goals, and above all, in advancing health equity. Today, you will hear about findings and lessons from more than 10 countries, which were coordinated across multiple partners involved in the COVID-19 response. They're just a teaser for what have helped us better understand our role at USAID as a donor and an institution supporting countries around the world, as well as local leaders and communities, to sustainably strengthen health system capacities, all of which has given us critical food for thought about not just what we want to achieve to strengthen health systems, but how it is that we should do it. Thank you again for having me, and we look forward to the event today. Thank you so much, Nidhi.
And now we'll turn to our panel. And as I said, we are going to break up these three um, discussions and presentations with audience Q&A. So we're putting you all to work at 9 in the morning. So get ready. We'll be calling on you soon. And good morning to our panel. I'd like to introduce all of them now, and then we'll have them come one one by one to this stage. So first, we'll hear from Jordano Smola. Um, she is the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Lead for USAID's Global Flagship Local Health Systems Sustainability Project, led by APT Associates. Jordi is trained in public health and epidemiology and has accrued over 15 years of experience managing, implementing, and evaluating health and development projects in low and middle income countries. She possesses technical expertise in monitoring, evaluation, and learning, geospatial studies, basic clinical medicine, and a range of public health programs, program implementation. Welcome, Jordi. Next is Megan Ivankovic, um, and she is a program director at Population Refu Reference Bureau, where she also serves as senior learning director for Momentum's Knowledge Accelerator. Meg has more than 17 years of experience working in public health and international development, specializing in applied research, capacity building and training, and program design, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. She previously worked for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, YHER, LLC, and a number of nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and D.C.-based small businesses. Welcome, Meg. And then we have Adele Wagaman, who is a senior digital health advisor at USAID's Bureau of Global Health Center for Innovation and Impact. Adele supports implementation of USAID's digital health vision and the agency's, the, the agency's first policy covering its investments in digital technologies and data systems used to support country-based health programs. Adele brings 15 plus years of experience building and leading digital transformation initiatives for governments, civil society, multilateral organizations, and the private sector. She serves on the board and advisory committees for a variety of organizations, including the Humanitarian Innovation Fund and Global Digital Health Network. Well, we are in good hands this morning, and just a reminder, there are bios on the QR code outside the door. So we will start first with Jordi, please. I'm uh, Jordana Smola from APT Associate. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So the, the title of my talk is Effects of Local uh, Response to COVID-19 <coughs> Pandemic mm -hmm. on Health System Strengthening. I'll be talking about uh, COVID-19 learning activity that uh, APT Associates was tasked to do through uh, his uh, LHSS or Local Health System Sustainability <coughs> project. So what is uh, LHSS? Uh, the Local Health System Sustainability uh, Project is USAID's flagship program for strengthening a uh, health system, and it has three core objectives. One is increasing financial protection, the second is increasing population coverage, and the third is focused on increasing coverage of quality essential uh, services. Uh, LHSS project has presence in uh, more than 20 uh, countries. So LHSS had been uh, supporting USAID's effort to respond to the pandemic in uh, multiple countries. You can see the list of 11 countries where LHSS had been supporting USAID's effort to respond to the pandemic, and the support was very uh, diverse, uh, starting from search support, procurement, to vaccination, and communication uh, campaign. But my talk today will be very much focused on uh, COVID-19 learning activity that LHSS was tasked to lead. And uh, as you know, this is one of the many efforts that is exploring the relationship between the pandemic response and health system strengthening. And this is specific learning activity is a collaborative effort between uh, USAID bureaus of uh, PPL and uh, global uh, health. So the main uh, learning question that we are trying to understand through this learning activity is uh, the outcome of incorporating broader health system strengthening within the pandemic response. So we are conducting this uh, learning activity in uh, five uh, countries listed here, and uh, we used multiple uh, selection criteria to come up with these five priority uh, countries or case studies. And uh, we had a list of 17 tier one and tier two global vaccine initiative countries. We also have the 11 countries where LHSS had been supporting the pandemic response. And using multiple criteria such as uh, geographic diversity, uh, the variation in uh, funding mechanism or funding stream, 
and maturity of the response, uh, we uh, identified the five countries for this specific learning activity, that is uh, Ghana, South Africa, Colombia, Peru, and Tajikistan. As you can imagine, this is a very complex subject. So we had to unpack the learning question into three sub-questions. So the first one is uh, navigating if and how the pandemic response funding was leveraged to strengthen or to support core health system functions. And the second one uh, is primarily uh, trying to understand if local capacity was strengthened and if that local capacity strengthening is preparing local actors to respond to future shocks or emergencies. The third one is a little bit broader in its scope and it's trying to uh, navigate what else happened in the in the health system, what were the broader effect of this response in the overall health system? So these are the three uh, sub-questions or sub-learning questions that we are uh, trying to understand through this uh, learning activity. Because of the complex nature of the question we are trying to answer, we felt like traditional methods might not be a right fit for, for this uh, learning activity. Therefore, we opted for complexity-aware methods. And we have uh, a list of complexity aware methods to choose from, but we uh, had to work with the five selected country representatives to choose the right fit for purpose. Based on that conversation uh, through a design workshop with all the five country representatives, we ended up selecting most significant change at the primary complexity aware methodology, supplemented by ripple effects mapping. Uh, this uh, method uh, su supplemented by the ripple effect is very helpful because it engages all actors and that was very important for the type of question we were trying to answer and uh, it also provides a rigor we need because we had to validate and this method allows for multiple opportunities to validate the stories that were generated uh, from uh, the investigation. And the most important other point uh, that this uh, MSC method coupled with ripple effect mapping was the fact that we were able to prioritize local perspectives or local voices in our uh, investigation. So based on uh, this, we decided to, to use MSC coupled with ripple effect mapping. Uh, as you all know, the uh, most significant change is a multi-step process, so we had to follow six-step process. And the first one was to identify the category or the change domains we should be investigating. The second one was focused on uh, in-depth uh, analysis of the change story. So we had to interview local actors to get a sense of what exactly happened in the health system. And this is where we supplemented the MSC method with the ripple effect mapping. So in every change story, we were able to explore what else happened. And uh, step three to five uh, was conducted in a workshop setting, which I will explain in the next slide, but it is the ranking and validation workshop stage. And of course, at the end, we'll be analyzing the results by objective and by uh, country. So. So far, we were able to go through the first five steps in Ghana and Peru. So please keep in mind that this is a work in progress. We still have to go to the remaining three countries. But we are excited to share the uh, learning that's emerging from these two countries so far. So uh, in uh, step three to five, uh, we had this uh, ranking and validation workshop. And what we did in these workshops was have a gallery walk. In this gallery walk, we were posting summary of every change story in a poster, and participants were allowed to walk and explore what happened in, in a change story. And we also supplemented this gallery walk with a booklet. So every participant had detailed story in their booklet if they need to refer. So that was one, and this really helped us to verify some of the stories we captured, and we were, uh, we were able to get additional evidence that supported our change story. In addition to the gallery walk, we had multiple breakout session and we uh, allowed participants to sit in based on their affiliation. For example, USC admission representatives were in one seat and implementing partners were in another. And every uh, member sitting uh, on the table was asked to review the change story and rank the most significant change story per domain. 
And of course, we also had multiple uh, plenary sessions and we were able to reconvene and discuss the validation, the justification for ranking and all that. So what did we learn so far? The methodology was interesting for the majority of our participants. We received feedback that this method allowed them to have rich conversation. They, they recognized the fact that some of the stories are challenging to rank because of the specific technical need or technical experience needed to understand some of the stories. But they were also impressed to see that the majority of the groups were able to prioritize similar story even when their justification might be different. For some, innovation is more important. For others, scale of the, uh, the response was important. But either way, they, they kind of appreciated the fact that they were able to prioritize uh, relatively similar change stories in the majority of uh, the cases. In addition to that, <coughs> we also uh, were able to note, based on the data from uh, Peru and Ghana so far, all the three questions uh, are answerable. For instance, we noticed that funding was, of course, leveraged to strengthen routine service delivery. And we have uh, multiple examples to support uh, this finding. For instance, in, in Ghana, uh, uh, there was installation of oxygen generating plant. And they were able to use this uh, oxygen generating plant not only for managing critical cases of COVID, but for uh, treating pneumonia and other uh, respiratory illnesses. And in some places like uh, Tamale in northern Ghana, we noticed that they were using this to treat newborn asphyxia. Uh, and, and the same goes in Peru. We have noticed that uh, a telemedicine registration system that was revitalized for uh, remote uh, counseling for COVID was later used for other chronic disease counseling, like mental health uh, counseling. The same uh, goes to the local capacity strengthening. We noticed local actors' capacity was strengthened to respond to future pandemics. Of course, there were multiple in-service trainings in, in most of the responses. If we, if we take, for example, uh, one of the trainings that uh, Peru provided to its lab technicians, there was advanced molecular testing uh, training that was provided to uh, selected experts in, in Peru, and this gave them the capacity not only to diagnose different strains of COVID, but this skill can translate to other infectious disease diagnoses, like in case of TB, HIV, and other infectious diseases. The PCR diagnosis capacity was very useful. And uh, obviously, that will also have some use for future uh, pandemics or emergencies. And the ripple effects we captured indicated that a lot was going on in the health system as a result of the pandemic response. Example, in, in Ghana, FDA had to revisit its regulatory function to produce vaccine locally. This was provoked or initiated as a result of a significant vaccine shortage. And through USAID funding, uh, FDA of Ghana was able to revisit their regulatory function so that in the future, they will be able to produce vaccine locally in a short period of time. So th this is, again, a response to, to the emerging uh, local, uh, local need. We have seen multiple uh, multi-sectoral collaborations. For example, in Peru, the education and the health sector was uh, working together to respond to the pandemic. But again, this uh, response team was later mobilized to respond to uh, dengue out fever. So uh, again, we, we are seeing multiple evidences of how uh, the pandemic response was uh, having some uh, broader effect in the health system. So overall, we, we can say that, yes, funding was leveraged to strengthen or to support core health system functions. You can see in red the core health system functions. We have also seen some sub-functions being strengthened. But what was also most uh, interesting was the fact that some of the responses were influencing more than one uh, core uh, system uh, function. So in some instances, responses meant for strengthening uh, case management or service delivery had some effect on human resource or uh, le uh, leadership and governance. For instance, the training I mentioned in Peru for lab technicians instigated the discussion to decentralize specialized lab diagnosis to subnational level. So that needed decision to, to revisit the regulation 
and uh, management structure they had, and they also had to cascade the training uh, to, to a subnational level, which again will uh, have some effect on human resource for health in addition to immediate case uh, management. Same goes for uh, local capacity strengthening. Uh, we have seen the capacity had been strengthened from individual, community, to health system level, and again, we have multiple examples uh, supporting, uh, supporting that this was happening. And uh, we can also say that uh, the response had multiple effects in the health system. For instance, we can take the Ghana example where a garment producing uh, uh, firm, in fact, there were three firms th that were producing uh, garment and they pivoted their production to medical product production like face mask and hand sanitizer with uh, a small seed money they received through USAID uh, funding. And this didn't only uh, uh, create the opportunity for these private firms to produce medical products, but it also created job opportunity for multiple used in, in Ghana. Uh, same with the telemedicine story I told you about earlier. It was used for other remote uh, service uh, provision for rural and remote clients, like in case of mental health counseling. Same goes with the oxygen generating uh, plants. So obviously the ripple effects of this res response was uh, evidenced in multiple of the stories we were able uh, to capture. So wha what is the lesson for future uh, emergencies? Th the, the lessons are multiple, but just to highlight a few, we notice that it is very important to have a systems thinking in emergency response. We have seen the multisectoral collaboration was very, very important for effective and efficient uh, emergency response, and we have noticed how engaging the private sector was critical to address the uh, protective equipment shortage that was uh, imminent in Ghana. And we have also noticed that it is important to focus on the problems and see how the problems can be uh, converted into a solution. For instance, in, in Ghana, uh, misinformation and disinformation was combated using the same social media platform and social influencers that uh, had the capacity to disseminate misinformation and disinformation. So it is, it's always good to look at the problems as an opportunity and get the solution from the same uh, problems. And uh, uh, we also noticed that it is very critical to pay attention to unintended consequences and be flexible to course correct as we go. It is emergency, time is short, there are so many dynamics, but it is uh, always good to focus on what else is happening in the health system that needs uh, intervention. For instance, in, in Ghana, the uh, electronic tracker system they created to track uh, uh, vaccination or vaccinated uh, individuals had imminent security threats. So that initiated the cybersecurity training Ghana was able to provide to, to its health system uh, managers, which again had multiple fold importance for, for the overall health uh, information system management in the country in the long run. And we also uh, noticed that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Even though we had to immediately respond to the emergent needs during emergency, it's good to work with existing structures. For example, in, in Ghana, uh, female headquarters who are migrants uh, moving from other parts of Ghana to the capital do not have access to regular services. So uh, it was possible to reach them through their social network or social structure for uh, COVID-19 uh, message communication and for uh, vaccination. So th these are just example of uh, the lessons we have learned so far, but we are hoping <coughs> that um, many more stories to come will give us additional lessons to share in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordi. And it was really, it was really interesting, um, audience, think about your questions. We'll turn it over to you in a second. But it's interesting to hear about the ripple effects of your work. And I just wanted to ask you just to speak a, a bit more on the implication of your work on future pandemics. Sure. <coughs> so the implication is a lot. Just to give you uh, some examples, we were very impressed to see how diverse the responses were. 
in, in, in Ghana alone, we were uh, able to see multiple stories, more than 25, uh, 25 stories coming. And that tells you uh, the response should be tailored to local needs because the story in Ghana is very different from the story in Peru. And we have to be very flexible to respond to local needs. That, that is one. And we have to also uh, be ready uh, to, to, to adopt as we go. One of the things we noticed was interventions were evolving with intensity of the, the emergency and with new problems that were emerging. For example, the communication uh, or messaging for COVID was evolving with the misinformation that was happening through the life of the pandemic, which was very different starting from there is no COVID to oh, of course there is COVID, but the vaccine doesn't work. So you have to tweak your messaging as you go. That is, uh, that's what uh, we also noticed. So uh, and, and it's also important uh, to to you know to begin with the end in mind. Uh, most countries were able to use uh, their uh, newly established response team or uh, uh, or resources for other routine service delivery. For for example, uh, this is an emerging story from uh, Colombia. They have a rapid response team that was established solely to respond to this pandemic, but later they had to absorb this rapid response team into their existing human resource structure, and they are ready to respond to future, future uh, emergencies when needed. So this uh, flexibility and understanding that uh, context matters and the needs uh, are very different from uh, one place to another, I think, are, are very important. Wonderful. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to open it up to the floor now. My colleagues have microphones. Does anyone have a question or comment for Jordi? One, two. Do any of our panelists have a question? For oh, we have one. Oh, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Oh, it's not on. Good morning. Thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Liz Leahy Madsen with the Momentum Knowledge Accelerator Project in PRB. Um, I really appreciated hearing all the examples you gave of the positive responses across the health systems in Ghana and Peru. But I'm curious if the analysis identified any key actors in these responses, in the sense that, you know, were these were these beneficial things all kind of happening independently in isolation, or were there a few key leaders or some coordination happening to sort of disperse these positive effects across the health systems? Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I think that's a very uh, good question. We, we have seen there were multiple actors. It's very difficult to pinpoint to one actor. Uh, although it's an emergency, it needs mobilizing uh, multiple sectors and multiple departments immediately. Of course, in most of the cases, the Ministry of Health was uh, leading most of the response efforts, but again, the specific actors were different. Uh, sometimes you can even see how powerful uh, sub-national uh, sub, uh, government uh, directorates were co compared to the national level uh, theme. So the specific actors might be different, but most of the responses was, were primarily uh, laid by the health uh, sector. Anybody else from the room? Please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Taylor Williamson, Apt Associates. Um, I just had a question on the methods. So I, I really applaud y'all for using uh, qualitative methods for thinking a little bit more intently about how you can actually like map change. And I'm curious how you initially generated those stories. Um, those seem to be like the basis of what you were doing, followed by the validation pieces. And I'm just curious, like, who was in the room to generate them? Where did they come from? You know, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Th that's in, uh, an interesting question. So uh, initially, we had to decide between the, the usual traditional methods, right? Even uh, in qualitative method, we had uh, to choose from uh, multiple approaches which we could have used, but we, we felt like, for instance, you cannot start with a specific theory of change or outcome in this type of situation because the outcome itself should be defined by the local, uh, the local uh, actors. So that's why we, to begin with, 
tried to avoid the usual traditional way of exploring this. So we, we opted for the complexity aware methodology, but again, even choosing that, we, we were not sure who had the say to define this is the important outcome. That's why we try to be very objective. We don't want to, 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 to be the one proposing these are the expected outcomes, these are expected changes, and now all we need from you is to tell us the pathway to those changes. So what we did is we had uh, what we called primary intended users. These are mainly USA admission and their core implementers. So we started our conversation with this group so that they can help us define what was happening in your health system as a result of the COVID-19 response. So it's a blank statement. So they're the ones who defined what was happening. And in, in that broader category of what happened in the health system, then we were asking them, okay, who can give us detailed information on this specific issue? For example, if the change was on a health information system, who is the local actor we can talk to, who can validate and give us a detailed information about, about this? And we had to, again, supplement that with desk review, but we also had to interview multiple, uh, multiple local actors. And it's like a snowball. You interview one local actor and they will refer you to another. So the story was growing as we go. And even in the workshop, some, some stories where uh, we, we were able to generate additional information, additional evidence to support uh, the stories. And in some instances, some of the stories were challenged by other participants. And th that was what we, we wanted. So all those interactions uh, gave us opportunities to strengthen the content of the story and to validate uh, what happened was really uh, as, as it was stated in the change story. Thank you. Thank you, audience, and thank you, Jordi. Now we will move on to Meg Ivankovic um, from PRB and the Momentum Knowledge Accelerator. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I have the great honor of sharing highlights of our work that sought to distill learning from Momentum Country projects as to how their COVID-19 response interventions serve to strengthen health systems. So I'll start by providing an overview of our learning activity, and then next I'll highlight some of our findings and lessons learned and share some recommendations that may be relevant for future pandemic or outbreak responses. So before I get started, I wanted to thank the broad range of staff from USAID and Momentum Global and Country Project teams who contributed to this research. I especially want to thank my fellow researchers at Momentum Knowledge Accelerator and the key informants who shared their experiences, insights, and recommendations. So to all who have been engaged in these efforts, whether named here or not, thank you. Momentum is USAID's flagship suite of integrated projects that work alongside governments, private and civil society organizations, and other stakeholders to acceler accelerate improvements in maternal, newborn, and child health, nutrition, voluntary family planning, and reproductive health. Between 2020 and 2023, Momentum supported over 15 countries to combat COVID-19 and maintain or improve the quality of care for related essential services. As I'll describe, Momentum projects also work to strengthen the resilience of the health systems in which they worked. This activity aimed to synthesize learning from select Momentum projects to understand the extent to which and how they used health system strengthening approaches in their COVID-19 response activities. Furthermore, we hope to distill factors that facilitated or inhibited the implementation of outcomes of HSS-oriented responses. We hope that the lessons learned and recommendations from Momentum could contribute to future approaches to integrating HSS and outbreak and pandemic responses, thus supporting low and middle income countries to build more resilient and learning oriented health systems. So to do this, we compared three different Momentum interventions in two countries. Two out of the three cases focused on mitigating the pandemic's negative impacts on essential services. In Sierra Leone, Momentum Country and Global Leadership provided rapid needs-based technical support focused on water sanitation and hygiene and infection prevention and control readiness in high volume facilities. In India, the Momentum Safe Surgery and Family Planning and Obstetrics 
worked to strengthen mechanisms in communities that faced a surge in gender-based violence during the pandemic to prevent, identify, and respond at the community and health facility levels. Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equities Intervention was designed to respond directly to the pandemic and sought to increase COVID-19 vaccination for priority vulnerable populations in hard to reach areas and tightly knit communities. They also provided direct technical assistance to state governments to improve the vaccine supply chain in India. For each case study, our research team conducted key informed interviews and focus group discussions with Momentum staff, staff of partner organizations, government partners, and community stakeholders involved in project implementation. We also conducted document and data reviews of project reports and records. These three cases were then analyzed to identify the similarities, differences, and patterns to better understand what factors influence their health system strengthening approaches. We used the Bertone Health System Strengthening Model to guide our learning activity. The model focuses on the processes that influence system dynamics, which in turn influence the HSS goals that contribute to improving health outcomes. The health system process goals are categorized under four main domains. Ownership, participation, and accountability, learning and resilience, use of resources, and service delivery. For the purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to focus on the health system process goals and outputs and outcomes of the momentum interventions. More information about how each of the three interventions was designed and implemented can be found in the case studies or the evidence synthesis report that I'll share at the end of this presentation. So before I get into what we learned, I want to share some important framing. So first, it's important to note that the interventions highlighted in these case studies were not health system strengthening interventions per se, but rather short-term investments in response to the emerging pandemic. Second, the long-term impact to the overall health system in each country and what was strengthened remains to be seen, since most of these interventions ended only recently. And finally, our study relied on information that provided primarily by health system actors, but unfortunately, we were unable to collect data from community members or health system users to validate these perspectives. So that said, as you'll hear, while the momentum cases d address different technical areas and different health service deliv delivery challenges that arose during the pandemic, they each address some components of and processes within the health system. Each can provide lessons learned about how to incorporate a systems approach during an emergency response. So I'll now provide more detail about how each of the momentum cases contributed to various HSS factors as de defined by the Bertone framework. All cases focused on increasing ownership and participation in the health system by the communities they served. The interventions demonstrated that increasing ownership by community leaders and influencers first, followed by the broader community, made a difference in mitigating mistrust and helping to maintain or increase demand for health services during the pandemic. Community feedback also informed strategies that improve the responsiveness of the health system. Another common thread throughout the cases was the use of community health workers to address misperceptions, to reach vulnerable populations, and increase demand for essential services by improving knowledge and supporting health behavior change among potential users of the health system. Working with community health workers was an example of absorptive resilience and that they helped to maintain essential services during the pandemic. For example, the India COVID-19 vaccination intervention engaged community leaders and influencers to use communication materials and to lead community awareness events to generate demand for COVID-19 vaccinations. They implemented various community approaches to make vaccine sites more accessible, such as using camel carts or mo uh, motorcycles to access remote areas. The project partnered with and mentored 26 community-based organizations to lead these community mobilization activities and to encourage uptake of COVID-19 vaccinations. Many of the project's activities focused on strengthening capacity of various types of service providers. However, capacity strengthening requires more than just one-time training. Supportive supervision to promote, to promote mentorship and joint problem solving and communication between supervisors and supervisees uh, was used by two of our interventions. Supportive supervision mechanisms that were initially led by the project and then transferred to local government resulted in various improvements and even improved quality of care at facilities. 
For example, in Sierra Leone, intervention-trained district health management team members supported healthcare facilities with on-the-job IPC training and support. They conducted monthly supportive supervision visits and QI-focused data collection visits to facilities using the Ministry of Health's Quality Improvement Policy to monitor compliance with national standards. This resulted in concrete improvements to the health workforce's knowledge and skills, as well as improvements to facilities WASH and IPC practices and provider behavior change to comply with government policies. The effectiveness of supportive supervision in Sierra Leone, as well as in the India Strengthening GBV Response Intervention, contributes to a growing evidence base about supportive supervision as a promising HSS practice. Several of the country case studies strengthen the capacity of local actors to collect and learn from monitoring data during implementation. They also supported efforts to apply that learning to encourage practice changes among health system actors and to improve service delivery and system performance. But the cases showed that monitoring tools and processes need to be user-friendly, accessible by all users, and to maintain client confidentiality. The momentum cases also showed that interventions that coordinated with subnational governments showed greater evidence of learning and resilience within the health system. So perhaps the best example of this is the India GBV response case, which worked to strengthen the existing national and subnational GBV response system and structures. The intervention employed staff that had direct relationships with government offices, which made it easy to finalize decisions and to obtain approvals to quickly roll out activities. When possible, district-level government officials also participated in joint supportive supervision visits. This helped to strengthen the capacity of providers and allow district officials to identify and observe challenges the providers faced and encourage them to identify and implement solutions themselves, thus ensuring that the activities were more responsive to the local context. Improved data quality on GBV issues in government databases, improved data use at the district and state levels since data were more reliable and timely. All interventions experience challenges uh, securing sustainable resources to continue or expand their emergency response efforts, but they were not always positioned to directly address these challenges. They struggled to secure sustainable financing for activities, which impeded pro projects' abilities to achieve transformative resilience. Informants mostly attributed these challenges to the short-term project timelines and financial resources available through donors and the lack of sustainable domestic funding sources. Furthermore, although the project strengthened individual health worker capacity, maintaining skilled workers in project areas was challenging. After Momentum trained service providers, it was in some cases difficult to manage the subsequent deployment of trained staff, resulting in significant information gaps that required more training and resources to fill. So as a result of the positive changes to the health system produced by the interventions, several key health outcomes could be seen as presented in this table. Such health outcomes include increased service coverage and utilization, and increased number of COVID cases identified. It's too soon to fully grasp the health impacts that resulted from the interventions. So in summary, although I don't have time to go over all of these details, each momentum intervention contributed to strengthening elements of the health system during their COVID-19 response efforts. For example, they strengthen the capacity of health system actors to collaborate with each other and to use data to support decision making, which could improve resource optimization. They also improved ownership and engagement of community leaders and members in health interventions, and they supported behavior, provider behavior change to improve quality of care in facilities. But there were a few gaps. As noted, it wasn't within the mandate for these momentum emergency response efforts to secure human resources, equipment and supplies, or sustainable financing for their interventions. These gaps do not imply a problem with implementation, but suggest that emergency response efforts cannot necessarily be assumed to be sustainable or to have system-level impacts. Rather, HSS approaches should be thoughtfully integrated into the design of future response efforts where it makes sense to do so. 
So as mentioned, the ultimate aim of this learning activity was that lessons learned and recommendations from these COVID-19 response interventions could contribute to future approaches to integrating HSS and outbreak and pandemic responses. <clears throat> so clearly I've listed way too many recommendations here that we have time to discuss. So I'll touch on just a few and hope that we can discuss more later in today's discussion. First, when designing future response efforts, it's important to build on structures and knowledge from previous pandemics. As seen in Sierra Leone, previous Ebola response efforts may have provided a foundation for the country's COVID-19 pandemic response. Maintaining the structures and knowledge from previous pandemics requires constant attention and additional resources, but is critical for effective responses. Secondly, we recommend that designers of future response efforts collaborate with country partners at all levels to design and implement interventions to increase their effectiveness and ownership. Activities should be designed around and with existing government policies and structures, thereby making it easier to obtain approvals, buy-in, and ownership from governments, and if possible, prioritize multi-sectoral collaboration, linkages, and networks. The strengthening GBV response in India case was the only momentum example that worked across multiple ministries. So hopefully these lessons learned and recommendations from momentum are useful for future pandemic and outbreak response efforts. So if you're interested in learning more about our work, please head to the Momentum website. The Evidence Synthesis Report offers a more comprehensive account of our, the background methodology findings and recommendations from our learning activity. The Policy Brief offers a summary of findings and highlights key recommendations for policymakers. And we are in the process of finalizing our case studies from our three Momentum interventions that were highlighted as a part of this work. And these cases will be finalized, hopefully with the, mo the month and posted to the website. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention, and I welcome any questions at this time. Thanks, Meg. And also just a note that we will make the slides available on the Wilson Center webpage after the event. So Meg, I'm gonna, you just went through some of the recommendations, but I'm gonna give you the same question I gave you already on what you think the main implica implication of your work is on future pandemics. I don't think we have one implication of our future pandemics, but I think the long list of recommendations that was built directly from our findings is hopefully helpful. And I think I've already seen parallels with Yordi's work as presented from the findings from their learning activity. But I did just wanna to touch on a couple more recommendations that I didn't have time to, to speak to. Um, but the first is uh, really trying to think about the private sector actors as a part of a total health system pandemic response. So unfortunately, as a part of our learning activity, we weren't able to highlight the work of one of our Momentum partners, uh, Momentum Private Healthcare Delivery, who really <coughs> focuses on engaging the private sector. Um, but obviously, because the private sector works outside the formal health system, uh, there's some uh, inherent benefits of, of working through those systems because you know they have less approvals and oversight, you're able to introduce innovations more quickly and easily. Of course, that work comes with more some challenges and that it can be um, that lack of oversight can be an inhibiting factor in ensuring quality. Um, but I think the sh with shorter wait times and more convenient business hours, private healthcare facilities may be a promising venue for future response efforts. Um, so it could also help to relieve overburden frontline public sector workers that we saw very clearly throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, so I think that's one recommendation. Um, and another, just wanted to highlight one of our findings related to su supportive supervision and uh, the need to strengthen continuous data collection and use for learning and quality improvement, which we saw very clearly throughout um, supportive supervision was implemented in two of our interventions and the focus on uh, regular data collection and, and learning was focused, highlighted in all three of our interventions. Uh, but just having that uh, regular access to updated data to understand uh, the needs and challenges enabled the interventions to adapt quickly um, and to respond to the local context and, and in all of the cases really led to improvements in quality of care. Great, thank you. Thank you, Meg. Now I'll turn it over to the audience. Do people have questions for Meg? Anyone, yeah. Hi, oh, thanks. Um, my name is Akbayong Ekanem. I work with Apps Associates and the uh, LHSS project. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it was, uh, was well laid out. I look forward to, to looking through the slides. <coughs> you mentioned supportive supervision quite a bit, <coughs> and I appreciated that because um, one, of the, 
one of the one of the critical health system functions, service delivery, does have supportive supervision as one of the, well, I say tools or you know one of the pieces in the in the backpack to kind of make to strengthen or to help support uh, improve the service delivery of whatever services, internal health, malaria, whatever it is. How do you think the learnings that come out of this? Because you said it's a promising health system strengthening practice, and I was trying to wrap my head around that term um how does that play with you know um how does that play out in other health system functions you know you did try to do some linking with data um, maybe the his function not sure but how do you think that would work in things like governance and financing or or some of the other pieces that like commodities for example did, 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 did any learning from our experience here touch upon that practice as a promising practice across the other functions apart from health service delivery? Epidang, that's such an important question and one that I don't think I'm best positioned to answer. Um, I think I can answer hypothetically, but would also invite others in the audience and particularly your colleague, uh, Dr. Mola, to, that might be able to speak to other um, settings in, in which they've seen this. But I guess I could um, respond to just having seen supportive supervision in one of our case studies in Sierra Leone, um, in terms of the, um, it really seemed to transform the informants that we spoke to that were recipients and also delivering supportive supervision. It really seemed to transform those relationships within the health sector. Um, but I think it's a as a it's a um, very adaptable tool that can be applied to any sector. So whether um, working with the supply chain officers in certain countries, whether working with um, managers, I think, in any sector. I think it's just uh, using those practices and using having setting up the structures to uh, encourage that regular engagement, I think, is would be applicable to, to any, of, any setting. But I do turn it over to some of our HSS experts in the audience or other colleagues that might be able to speak to some of those other components of HSS where they've seen supportive supervision implemented. Anyone want to take that from the audience? <laughs> oh, yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Lara Vaz with uh, Momentum Knowledge Accelerator and uh, PRB. And I'm not necessarily within the Momentum work, but I have certainly witnessed some of the work and done evaluations of some of the work around um, neonatal resuscitation in Uganda and the importance of supportive supervision, not just in terms of strengthening the, the clinical service delivery skills, but also strengthening the voices of the clinic um, staff and managers to be able to speak on the other factors that are influencing their ability to deliver quality services. And that includes the availability of supplies. Um, and it includes the regular maintenance of equipment. Um, it includes looking at the conditions of the delivery rooms um, and advocating for things to be restructured. So I, I do think that supportive supervision allows for, um, for voice um, as well as um, opportunities for, for seeing beyond just the, the, the immediate action that they're taking. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, you go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for a really interesting presentation. Um, Meg, I wanted to pick up on your point about the importance of continuous uh, data collection and data use. And um, you had highlighted, I think, the importance across all the case studies. In the MSSFPO GBV case study, you talked about how improving data quality helped to really foster improved data use. But I was wondering if there were other things that were happening as well to kind of uh, enhance data use, and if you could comment on uh, maybe across the other case studies as well, sort of how that, what they were doing really to foster that. Thanks. Thank you so much for that question, Barbara. And um, I think, you know, I having, uh, Working for MKA for the last three and a half years, I've no recognized in the culture within all Momentum Awards a, a 
great attention to continuous learning and a focus on high quality, da quality data. So I think one of the things that um, has what that I saw across all, interve all interventions was the focus on momentum projects to encourage that um, for all of their in activities, not just the COVID-19 response um, interventions. So um, I think that is just being a, having a regular attention to um, having those conversations about data collection, about what high quality needs are, seeing an openness for, intervent for innovation in terms of how awards are approaching um, data collection, having uh, great uh, communication across awards as well, and of course within the, the global community, I think there were a lot of um, data quality and the need for high quality data to improve our interventions and outcomes um, was an issue that everyone was facing. Um, so I think at least within some of our momentum intervent interventions that were highlighted here, they were just regularly uh, tackling those challenges and coming up with immediate solutions um, you know, that were definitely outside of the box to, to try to solve them quickly. Wonderful. Thanks, Meg. And now we will move on to our third presentation from Adele Wagaman, um, who I've already introduced, but she is the Senior Digital Health Advisor at USAID's Center for Innovation and Impact. Welcome, Adele. Okay, how's everybody feeling? Good. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers for hosting this event. It is so important to think about what we're learning, especially from crisis situations that do move so quickly where the needs are um, paramount and time is of the essence. It's easy to get swept up in that. And um, to not prioritize taking stock of, of what we're learning as we go. Uh, so I appreciate this dedicated effort that the partners have taken that have presented so far and shared and in this conversation so that we're learning from one another's efforts. Um, so it's a pleasure to be sharing with you some of the work we've done at USAID to learn in particular from the use of digital technologies and data systems as part of our country-based programs responding to COVID-19. Uh, that's a field we refer to, the use of digital uh, technologies and data systems as digital health. So if you hear me use digital health as a shorthand, uh, that's, that's what I'm referring to. And so I'll talk a little bit about this digital health COVID-19 vaccine service delivery learning initiative, um, but I'm also gonna pull out a little bit and put it into context of a broader learning um, initiative within USAID that traces back at least to the West Africa Ebola outbreak response, um, where USAID also similarly took a dedicated effort there to assess what was happening in order to learn from it and think about how we could mainstream those learnings and, and modify our programs accordingly. Um, so who here has seen this picture before? at least one hand in the audience. So for those who are not familiar with this picture, this is a photograph of a whiteboard in Monrovia, Liberia, um, shortly after the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And um, it was an effort by folks in the Ministry of Health, together with some development partners, to understand what was happening. And as you can tell by looking at the picture, it was a complex and dynamic situation. We had a very fast-moving disease outbreak um, posing new needs, in including safe and dignified burials, which of course were really critical to helping to further contain, uh, the, or contain the further spread of Ebola. And I think what this picture does a great job of demonstrating is, is how important information and data are. I think historically we haven't looked at um, critical health commodities and, and thought about information and data, but this slide really shows us how critical those components are. And what's happened as health systems have increasingly digitized is that we've seen the need to think about change management around the use of digital systems. And so um, over a number of years, at least 20 years, that we've been investing in different kinds of mobile and electronic-based um, digital technologies, we've seen a huge growth in individual siloed and standalone systems. And this is one of the things that we really need to be mindful of as we think about how we want to scale digital technologies um, to make sure that we're avoiding the challenges of, of fragmentation and, and lack of interoperability. And this is not just a technological problem, it's also a human and institutional one. Yes, we need to be able to establish 
interoperability across different systems to have a holistic picture of epidemiological and health system strengthening needs. Um, but we also need to be thinking about the capacity for governance and for leadership, for um, workforce and human capacity to both power and to keep pace with this change of a digital transformation. Excuse me for just one second, I'm gonna get some water. So, This is a gentleman from the Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone. And um, this quote's probably from 2015. He's talking about the situation during the Ebola outbreak response and the challenges posed by data that are fragmented into silo digital systems. This was a huge problem during the Ebola outbreak response and you'll hear that that problem persists. So he's saying until now data has been captured in a fragmented manner that impedes any decision making or ability to have an accurate and reliable picture of exactly what is happening. And of course, in the context of a disease, out disease outbreak like Ebola or like COVID or you name it, uh, we need to know quickly what's happening in order to respond appropriately. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the Global Digital Health Forum last week, which if you don't know of it, is an annual gathering of folks working in the um, global health space, leveraging digital data and, and technologies to support health programs where we come together to share lessons and um, learn from one another. And there were a number of Ministry of Health representatives there, one of whom was a gentleman by the name of Jean-Thierry Colombo from the uh, Ministry of Health in the Democratic <coughs> Republic of Congo. And he brought up the same challenge during the COVID response. And he said, and, and this is important to note in particular because DRC is a country that has had 11 different outbreaks of Ebola. Uh, and so you think about the resilience that is needed uh, in the health system to be continually prepared to new outbreaks, including but certainly not limited to Ebola. And he says, when you have systems that don't share information, it's really a big headache for governments to know what's happening. So clearly this is a persistent challenge and, and one that we need to be thinking strategically about how we respond to, um, to ensure that countries are best prepared to respond to new outbreaks as they occur. So this is the culmination of USAID's effort to learn from uh, the Ebola outbreak response. It's a report, Fighting Ebola with Information, that includes a call to action that I encourage everyone to read because much of it remains evergreen. But just to highlight some of the key points here, it focuses on the need to build country capacity for digital systems management and use. So how do all of these different digital technologies come together in a way that is organized and rationalized and can support and strengthen the health system, both in the context of res responding to an acute health emergency and on an ongoing basis. It talks about the need for standards um, to enable data exchange across a number of different digital systems. And it talks about the importance of change management, right? When you introduce dig digital technologies, you're not just changing the format of data and information. There are large um, change management needs around uh, workforce training and capacity, institutional policy and practice, and uh, governance and regulation and leadership that's needed at the national level to manage that process. So USAID, um, took those lessons, there was, there was a great quote from somebody and we interviewed for the Fighting Ebola report who said, you know, we don't really learn the lessons until we act on them and that stayed with me and I think USAID has shown that we uh, are committed to acting on those lessons and this inaugural policy document is uh, one way that you can see that demonstrated. So this is a policy document that was published in December of 2010. A vision for Action and Digital Health. This is the first time um, we have dedicated policy guidance around the way we invest and manage and use digital, digital technologies and data systems as part of our health programs. And the four priorities, which I won't read through, but you can see them there on the slide, are directly responsive to the findings from the call to action and the Fighting Ebola with Information report. So we're learning and adapting. And now here we are talking about the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which followed just months after the publication of this report. So we had well-established guidance based on lessons from prior global health emergencies to, to guide our work together. So there were multiple phases of the COVID-19 response, and you could see fluctuations in the kinds of digital technologies and data systems that were used according to each of these phases. The first were efforts to detect and contain the virus, where you saw a lot of investment in contact tracing and behavior and change and communications tools as a couple of examples. 
And then we had the vaccines and moved toward delivering vaccines, where you saw large investments in supply chain and logistics management information systems. And then finally, making sure that we were getting the vaccines from ports to arms. So ensuring that vaccines could become vaccinations, where we saw um, investments into vaccine cert certificate systems and systems to track um, adverse uh, impacts. GlobalVax was an initiative that began um, in December of 2021, so it was a later wave of looking across all of the efforts that USAID led as part of the COVID-19 response that allocated $1.8 billion in funding to 120 partner countries and supported 688 million vaccine doses donated. And we showed that we had learned many of the hard lessons from the West Africa Ebola outbreak response, including an emphasis on adapting and reusing di existing digital systems. This is important because these are the systems that are already part of the health system. Uh, when you adapt and reuse those systems, you're expanding their functionality, you're leveraging existing capacity, and you're continuing to invest in the existing digital infrastructure in the country as opposed to introducing yet another new tool. This was not necessarily um, a, a blanket approach. We did see some new um, systems invested in where there weren't existing systems to meet that need, but you could see this definite trend toward reuse and adaptation um, that we think is a helpful approach. So let me now jump in and um, focus a bit in a bit more detail on what we did, and, and I'm going to show you a bit more, a few more slides that. Um, all right, we'll break this down, but, but this was a theory of change. So we worked together with um, four centrally funded mechanisms um, funded by the Global Health Bureau to support COVID-19 uh, vaccine distribution, leveraging digital health. And these were CHISU, the Community Health Information Systems and Data Use Program, DataFi, the Data for Implementation Mechanism, Digital Square, and Momentum, the Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity, or MRIGHT mechanism. And there were a number of us within USA that were working on this together across uh, the Global Health Bureau, but also with other uh, operating units and country offices to, to shape this work together. So the theory of change essentially is asking, when we made these investments in digital and data systems, how were they both meeting immediate needs associated with the response, which was what these funds were designed to do, right? These were not funds that were designed to contribute to long-term health system strengthening. These were COVID-19 ARPA funds designed to meet emergency COVID-19 needs around vaccine delivery. So what was that immediate impact? And to the extent that we could see a little bit into the future, because this is an exercise that uh, lasted over you know, probably 16 months, so a limited window of time to be looking at the longer-term health impacts, but to the extent which we think we could begin to see longer-term health impacts, what did that look like? So this is a photo here of one of the workshops we ran um, with USAID staff and the implementing partners to design the theory of change. We had partners who were working on a broad array of different kinds of inputs, from digital and data systems readiness assessments and guidance, to software systems implementation support, such as adapting and reusing existing systems, or enabling um, data exchange through interoperability. And then we had um, investments that were really more data use focused, looking at data analysis, data use, and data quality interventions around vaccines delivery. And here is where we looked at immediate outcomes. So um, to the extent that we could see within the duration of the research period that we were working within, how, for example, were guidance materials being used to address capacity gaps, or were digital systems being adapted and integrated into routine health information systems? And what could we see about strengthened data use and government coordination? And to the extent that we could, as I mentioned earlier, uh, look into the future and begin to see change, what could we tell about the longer-term impact on vaccines delivery or on strengthened health systems, in particular as it relates to the digital health enabling environment. And that's something I'm happy to talk more about in the discussion period. So overall, there was a tension, as I mentioned earlier, between the need to act quickly and build sustainably 
And yet we saw that both could be done, not in all instances, but in enough to show that it is possible to design funding and digital and data systems in a way that does meet urgent needs while also continuing to support uh, longer term health system strengthening. All of these findings are going to be published uh, next year in a USAID sponsored supplement of the Oxford Open Digital Health Journal. So I hope this presentation has helped to whet your appetites and that when the supplement comes out, you will pick it up and take a look through it. Um, but just to give you some key takeaways, we saw that in particular where there was existing digital systems and digital health capacity in place, countries were better prepared to respond. I think we've heard echoes of this across the two uh, prior presentations as well. Uh, we saw that stopgap measures were important, especially earlier in the COVID-19 vaccination effort but created their own challenges later in the response. Um, many of these systems, um, once they met the need they had been stood up to serve, um, stopped being used. Uh, and so they didn't contribute directly to longer term health system strengthening, which maybe is not necessary in all cases. Um, but you could ask yourself the question, um, was there a different way to build that tool in a way that would be available to meet uh, ongoing needs? And then finally, we saw Digital health investments designed to support COVID-19 vaccination efforts could add value beyond the emergency phase of the response. And you'll see in the supplement a number of uh, different case studies um, from 11 different countries that give you a variety of different examples of what that might look like. Um, just one being the use of um, data systems to track individual level vaccination records being adapted and reused to support, for example, in Indonesia, a new digital um, electronic health record. So a lot of examples there. So I'm going to zoom back out and put this research effort back in the context of the um, larger global health response to COVID-19 and, and some reflections on that space. We were, as USAID, invited to contribute to the OECD Development Cooperation Report in 2021 and talk about how we were responding to the COVID-19 outbreak and what we were learning as we were going. And I think this um, paragraph here has some good key points that will carry over into what we should be doing next, how we should be continuing to take these lessons and, and act on them. And so it talks about the complexity and the global health architecture and how this requires a high degree of coordination in order to find alignment between country priorities and global health funding. And I think if you look at the COVID-19 funding samples, uh, funding waves, it's a great example of that complexity where you had a number of different funding institutions with different rounds of funding that um, differed depending on where we were in the response and uh, created a high degree of complexity for countries who were applying for those funds. So some things we can be thinking about in the future that will address some of these common challenges include what more can we do to create um, basic information about where countries are in their health system and health se sector digital transformation journeys? What is their capacity? What are the systems that are in place? Um, and what more can we be doing as we did during the COVID-19 response to coordinate not only within funding institutions, but also across funding institutions. So we have a good collective picture of how we're investing in this space and we're thinking about how to design those funds to be responsive to continually evolving country need. So this is an initiative that USAID was happy to um, co-create and co-sponsor during the COVID-19 response. Uh, DICE stands for the Digital Health Center of Excellence, a little creativity there on the acronym. Um, but was a new facility hosted by WHO and UNICEF that was designed to meet some of these specific needs around improved donor coordination, ensuring alignment with best practice, uh, such as the digital investment principles and the principles of um, donor alignment for digital health, and to ensure that the kind of uh, technical assistance that was, being that was being provided aligned with that best practice. And um, this is something that we need certainly in the context of a crisis, but also on an ongoing basis. And uh, that's why I was very excited this year to see the Indian presidency of the G20 um, identify digital health as one of three core priorities for their health working group and uh, the creation of this new global initiative on digital health being announced as one of the core outputs of uh, the 2023 health sector G20 meetings. And this new um, guide is another kind of slightly creative acronym for a global initiative on digital health, but guide is, is the um, shorthand. 
it has been created to take the premise of what was being done with the DICE initiative that was focused on the COVID-19 response and really mainstream it. So that we're doing this um, gathering of basic information about where countries are so that we can be strategic and targeted and focused in our digital health investments in countries, um, certainly in the context of a disease outbreak or health emergency, but also on an ongoing basis. And I think this kind of centralizing of information and, and facilitating coordination uh, is really critical to enabling a um, sustainable support structure for countries as they're undergoing this complex process of digital transformation that will certainly bear fruit both in the context of strengthening routine uh, health information systems and health systems overall, um, but also really helping countries bolster their uh, preparedness and response capacity, which I think will serve us well given what we know about um, where we're headed in terms of the impacts of, of climate change and the increased pressure that will put on health systems, whether we're talking about um, an increase in zoonotic disease or an increase in, in heat waves and, and the impacts those can have on the health system. So I think it's important um, that, we, that we learn and that we adapt um, and that that's really a critical way that we can show resilience as a broader global health community inclusive of funders and, and development partners and the countries that we serve. Thanks. Thank you, Adele. Thank you. And I want to give you, even though you just touched on some of this right in those last comments, I just want to give you the same opportunity as your fellow panelists just to give a, another word to the implication of your work on future pandemics. And then we'll turn it over to the audience here. And I also have some questions from the online viewers. Sure. Um, so a few reflections. I think when you have a disease outbreak, especially a novel disease outbreak uh, like COVID-19, it really focus us, foc it forces us to think beyond the um, usual framework through which we think about global health, right? Which is a very fragmented framework. We think about individual health disease areas um, in addition to thinking about cross-cutting issues like health system strengthening and uh, how we can shore up primary health care. And so it's an important opportunity for us to be thinking about, well, what is the shared value we have in strategic digital health systems transformation? Um, how can we invest in a way that is not only meeting the needs of each individual health program, um, but is also supporting the country to be more resilient, whether that's in the face of new emergencies or um, in its capacity to deliver health services at the primary care level. And so I think this cross-cutting approach is one that um, is certainly well established, but is also one that we need to really double down on because it is one that will benefit all health programs. Um, it is one that will benefit countries in terms of building resilience and is one that benefits the entire health system, including the health workers who we know, of course, are um, the front lines and core to, to health system strengthening and healthcare delivery. Um, and I had the opportunity recently to be in Indonesia for a couple of weeks to see the work that was being done there and um, visited a few different clinics and asked the health workers in the clinics I visited, what do you need? What is your hope? What would you like to see done differently? And without fail, every single one of them said, could you please do something about the duplicative data that we are required to enter? It's a real burden. And of course, we hear that domestically too from our health workers and our doctors, right? That That's a source of tension with care and service delivery. And so, Thinking strategically about how we design and invest in digital systems is certainly critical to them as well um, to enable interoperability so they only have to put the data in once. They're not having to put the same data into multiple systems. Um, and then from the health system planning perspective, um, to enable better access to data that you need in order to understand from an epidemiological perspective and a disease outbreak where the disease is, who it's impacting, um, but then also you need in order to mount an effective operational response. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have a question in the audience here for Adele? All the way in the back. Please, we'll bring you a microphone. A question, because I work with Federally Qualified Health Center here in DC as part of my work on Latino immigrant health. And um, you know, one of the challenges is just coordinating data across platforms, like different health centers use different platforms and it becomes a challenge then to compare and to also share data. So I was not familiar with the initiative um, 
to what extent do you promote a particular platform, or can we be more forward thinking about how this affects, you know, um, the countries where you're working in, and 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 how to you know better make use of of data um, by using it one particular platform? Just curious. Yeah, thanks for the question. There's a big sign that says "Don't adjust mics," yeah. so I'm going to adjust myself. <laughs> um, we, we do not, is the short answer, um, promote specific tools. What we've tried to do through the digital health vision and through the way we invest in general is to ensure that we're building country capacity and that um, we're leveraging standards and so that we're creating an ecosystem of choice. And countries are free to select the systems that work best to um, meet their need. And we're seeing large understandable interest from countries in thinking about how to capaci capacitate and, and use resources um, within their own private sector so that you're, they're procuring locally to build, design, implement digital systems to meet their country's needs. Um, and the move that we're seeing towards standards, the use of um, and the emergence of WHO's smart guidelines um, really help accelerate that transformation. And I think when we look to the future, we're going to see uh, a lot of rapid growth in that space, a in addition to some of the more widely known um, software global goods, uh, like DHIS2, for example, the, being the most widely scaled ones um, that are used commonly in, in many low- and middle-income country health systems. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to move to, and we have a couple online questions, and I have a couple of questions that go across looking at stakeholders and community engagement that I think each one of you could really answer. Um, but were there certain groups that you needed to connect with for each of your work in different contexts before you could engage with communities as a whole? We had an event last week with Momentum, Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity, and a few of the speakers really spoke to the, the need of engaging male family members for permission um, for COVID vaccine uptake or finding tribal or community leaders. Um, and so I'm interested across the work that you all were doing, if there were particular groups of people and community leaders that you needed to connect with First, and our, our question from the audience, from the audience, the online audience, is to Yordi. So we'll have you start. Um, were you involved with the ministries of planning and/or finance, in addition to any of these community stakeholders that you want to mention? So, uh, starting from the last question, uh, if uh, Ministry of Finance or Planning was involved, yes. In mo in some of our stories. We noticed that multiple ministries need to be engaged, and that's why we emphasized the importance of multi-sectoral and multi-directorate or department uh, collaboration to respond uh, to COVID because uh, th there was a lot of funding coming uh, to uh, to respond to the the pandemic from uh, different uh, sources, even other than uh, USAID. So there definitely was a need to for the different uh, departments to come together and prioritize uh, and use the resources uh, appropriately. So the, the finance and planning uh, directorates of the Ministry of Health were very critical in in the response. And of course, when we invited. Uh, participants for the workshop, we try to make sure every local actor engaged in the response was in that room, because uh, some of the stories uh, are very specific and very specialized, as I mentioned earlier, that needed insight from these specific groups, like the FDA story, for example, we had to add representatives from, uh, from those departments uh, to, to talk about the story we are not seeing. So the answer, in short, is yes. Uh, community engagement, yes. Uh, again, I, I can go back to the, the Ghana example I mentioned earlier. Of course, we have uh, heard some stories where traditional leaders are uh, were very critical to access the community for uh, COVID messaging and mobilizing the community for uh, for uh, vaccination. They were uh, very key. Similar to the head porter, uh, the female head porter story I mentioned earlier, it was very important to go through their hierarchy and their own social network to reach to every 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 uh, female uh, porter. So uh, the answer again is yes, we had to go through the existing uh, community structure to, to reach to the wider community. <coughs> Wonderful, thank you. Meg or Adele, do you wanna add anything? 
I can just jump in because this is, of course, one of our leading findings of the importance of community engagement and involving local community members. I would say just in some, I think the answer is going to be different depending on the context in which we're working. And so even across the three different momentum interventions that we highlighted here, each uh, team had very different approaches in terms of how they implemented their intervention. Um, they all uh, engaged the Ministry of Health and as well as different state and district level government officials, which was critical for making progress in their interventions. Um, but I would say, uh, more importantly, they were they targeted specific both community organizations or even just uh, community leaders mm -hmm. in the different uh, areas that they were uh, trying to work in. So I think just being um, responsive to the local context in order to uh, would increase the Im impact and effectiveness of the interventions. Yeah, great, thank you. Adele, did you want to jump in too? Yeah, just a similar um, approach on our side where each of the research and authoring teams um, made a special effort to ensure that they were directly engaging, certainly the Ministry of Health, but where possible community members as well, um, and to ensure that members of the um, authoring teams also included some of those country perspectives so that it wasn't just that we were seeking the inputs and then taking them away and writing from you know the perspective of people based in Washington, but that we had authorship teams that were balanced between um, Washington-based folks and people who are based in, in country. Great, great, thank you. Um, and we're about to go to the audience in the room um, again, but just another question for Meg. Um, what led you and your and or your team to target the gender-based violence response systems and structures in the India case study? Um, and does this strategy seem to also be one that could be applied in other contexts and in future pandemics? as an entry point. In terms of what made us in, focus on that intervention for the selection of for this learning activity or how to- Right, for, for what made you as that being an entry point to meeting with those women and then the connection between the uptake and the COVID-19 vaccine? Excellent question. I might have to defer to my colleague, Maya Johnstone, who's in the audience who actually uh, collected data in India to learn more about that intervention. Um, but I, I'll just note for all of the interventions that we highlighted as a part of this work, um, we did, it is, was a convenient sample, and so we did reach out to each of the Momentum Awards to allow them to share interventions uh, that they wanted to highlight that they thought um, touched on different elements of health system strengthening. Um, so I don't know if I could answer that question specifically, mm -hmm. but we would, I would also invite um, my colleagues, hopefully that are listening online, to, to respond. Laura, do you have a response? It sounds like the, the question is really more about why did Momentum Safe Surgery and Family Planning and Obstetrics choose to um, the, the one-stop centers and addressing gender-based violence as a point of entry. And it seems I, from the case studies, actually what we saw early on was a spike um, in reporting of gender-based violence and a recognition that in order to address COVID-19, there needed to be a response also to the sort of the secondary effects, which were the increases in the, in the gender-based violence. So that's where they took the opportunity to, to look at that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that would be an interesting thing as we've seen across pandemics and other emergencies, there tends to be the increase in gender-based violence. So it's an interesting entry point. Um, it may be something for a future discussion if there is more interest in that. So now I would like to open it up to the floor here. We have just a few more minutes if we have any questions, final questions for the panel, please. Hi, Rachel Marcus, USAID. Um, thanks to everyone for an interesting discussion today. And I know we're at time, so I just wanted to make a quick comment, really, which is just to say that I think when we started this learning activity and, and all of these investments, we really had a, a question about how or if we could or should be incorporating health system strengthening approaches into what was an immediate live saved oriented response. And, you know, although, of course, that's still a big picture question um, and one that's really context specific in nature, I think what we really see across all of these examples and the learning that's been that's been synthesized here is that it's not necessarily a, a question of can you, it's really a question of how. Um, and so it's not necessarily the black and white dichotomy that I think often we perceive it to be that you can and really should be obviously prioritizing the, the necessary live saves orientation in an emergency response, but taking a health systems approach to that. And I think that can though mean quite different things, right, across contexts. Um, 
So just to reflect, I think what I heard really today, and I've seen a lot of this learning so far, but really heard come through today for the first time, is that that can, at minimum, really just mean you don't actually undermine the system throughout your response effort, right? Um, and that could be sufficient and necessary if you're prioritizing shots in arms as we were here, um, but to do so in a way that it do at least doesn't undermine the existing system. And then if you have the opportunity and it's appropriate in the context to be thinking more towards those tran transformative approaches where we're actually working to, to sustainably strengthen system aspects of the system throughout the response is obviously ideal, um, but not always possible and I think important to recognize as well. So just a big thank you because it's been really Really exciting to hear the different learning and, and lots of commonalities and lessons learned coming out um, from today. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that comment. And does anyone want to respond to that in our final moments? Anything to add? Agreed. You agree? <laughs> okay. We will all agree. Then with that, we will we'll close out our event today. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists for being here today, to our audience in the room and to our audience online. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, everything from today will be, the live recording will be posted on the website. We will also produce an event summary, which will probably be published at the start of the new year, so no one loses it in the holidays. Um, thank you also, of course, to USAID's Momentum Knowledge Accelerator and the Local Health System Sustainability Project for making this event possible. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I wish you all a happy, healthy, safe, holidays and new year. Thanks so much.